uh, welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing an August reading wrap up. If you didn't know, August was my birthday month. Uh, <laughs> so I had a grand old time. Also, hi, I'm, I'm Ali. I'm your bookish pal, Al. Let's get going because I read 11 books in August and I read nine of them in a week. Anyway, I'm going to do... I'm gonna do this just in chronological order because I can't for the life of me think of any way else to structure this reading wrap up. I I think on my blog I think on my blog I I structured it as like my favourite titles or my favourite book covers or something. I don't know, but I have no energy for that right now. So let's just talk about them chronologically. Now the first book that I read was a non-fiction novel and Actually, wait, let's talk stats. <laughs> I'm a bit everywhere today. So I read 11 books that came to approximately 3,939 pages. I read quite a lot of novellas this month, I think. I mostly read books that were between 300 to 499 pages. I read 91% fiction and 9% uh, non-fiction that 9% is actually just one book it's just one book uh, my top three genres was literary classics and young adult which is nice and I mostly read physical books but some of them were ebooks and whichever ones uh, I'll let you know and my average rating for the month of August was 3.61 so like pretty good but also not amazing so both great and sad at the same at the same time. So let's go chronologically. So the first book I read was a non-fiction novel and it was On Freedom. Uh, what's the full title? On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Constraint by Maggie Nelson. <sighs> I did a whole rant about this in a previous video. I'll link. I've mostly, I've, I've, actually talked about most of these books in various blogs so I'll link them all down below and up above if I can. Uh, this book really disappointed me. There were aspects of On Freedom that I bloody loved, uh, just like the ideas that Maggie Nelson was saying, right? But overall I, it felt very, uh, it felt very 2016 to be honest because it was mostly written in 2016 and it, it felt very disconnected from the reality that most women are feeling and just like get down out of your white tower basically like it just it, f it felt very disconnected from reality her ideas surrounding consent was weird just like really really slightly weird and a couple of things about um the way that we should perceive the impact of colonization on indigenous peoples and how you know as white people how we should look towards indigenous people for wisdom in how to deal with the destruction of our world but the way that she wrote it and i literally talk about this in in the video that i'll link down below it's very condescending and it was very pro I felt very it felt very problematic I felt the way that I interpreted it was kind of like a well the destruction of your reality was like bad but the one that's happening right now is like worse so can you just like be a doll and help us like it just that's how it felt and there were a lot of aspects similar to that that was like kind of sprinkled through the the book that I didn't quite like also just her idea of consent and power and control in relationships was so weird it was so weird it felt very boomer I'm gonna say that it felt like oh, what are the young people complaining about now kind of thing she should have rewritten this in the current context I just yeah, it was fine. I ended up giving it three stars, but the more I talk about it, the more I just don't like it. Which is a real disappointment because I really loved the Argonauts. But, oh well. We can't all have winners. And then the next book that I read 
was actually a short story collection and this is I think within the same reading vlog that I read on Freedom and it was Sabrina and Karina by uh, Carly Fajardo Anastine. This was great. It was a really great short story collection. I'm pretty sure it was a debut short story collection. Again, there were some misses, but majority of it, I had a good time. It really focused on the experience of women, specifically uh, Latin American women and Latin American Indigenous women. So it was just centering women's voices, really underscoring some really important themes surrounding identity and family, but also like racism and misogyny and colonization and the impact and legacy of that. I really, I did really like them. I think personally, there wasn't necessarily a standout short story, uh, but I am very excited to see what the author does next because there were, I do remember the way that, I think it was the first story, the way that she described just like the landscape and the characters within the landscape was very beautiful and very like impactful but again not a short story collection that I would consider a favorite but I would definitely like recommend it to people I just try to think of what I what I said back in the day when I read it <laughs> it, it felt like I it feels like I read this book years ago which I don't know if that's just a testament of my memory or a testament of the book you know what I mean so yeah good it was a good collection if you want a good time good and interesting time read it um it's very much in the similar vein to uh like mariana enriquez and disha filior uh where it's just like regardless of who they are as women even if they're absolutely atrocious they it's their story and it's giving space to these women to just like be who they are even if who they are is not like palatable right it's pretty good and then i read finally fucking read finally read it feels like i've been wanting to finish this for ages which it most likely is or oh, most likely has been <laughs> the shadow rising by uh, Robert Jordan, which is book four in the Wheel of Time series. I'm slowly making my way through this series. I fucking love this series. Oh. And I'm not really, I can't really talk about what happens in this because it's a spoiler because it's book four, but just know. Just fucking know that I love this series. I loved this book. Pretty sure book three is still my favorite as of right now because just so much happens in terms of character development in that one that I just, oh, I just, it gets me every time. But this, Perrin? I love Perrin, he's my precious wolf boy and I love him so much. I love him so much. I don't give a fuck about Rand. For me, it's Perrin. Perrin is my boy, okay? I love him. I love, just like, actually, I love everyone, I do. I do, and that may, it might make me really toxic, but I love Moraine. <laughs> Maybe because Rosamund Pike plays her in the series, so like I always envision her as Rosamund Pike, and I love Rosamund Pike. But I I love this series. So how do I talk about this book? Um. Oh, I don't I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how to talk about it. I just love it so much. So we have a group of one, two, three, four, five people who, well, okay, I'm not, I'm not describing this right. Okay. It has been a while since I've described it. So like in book one, right, you begin with like a group of three guys, Rand, Perrin, and Matt, and you also have Nynaeve and Egwene. Egwene? Egwene. And Egwene and Nynaeve are young women. Nynaeve is the wisdom of their town, which is basically like, think of it like a, a healer, a witch maybe, and Egwene is, is like going to be trained to take over Nynaeve's position or, and, and, and or help out. But like shit's happening behind the scenes. 
so we have um mm. <laughs> so we have Tarvalon and we have the Aes Sedai and Moraine is an Aes Sedai bitch she's a witch she well the easiest way to describe her is that she's a witch she uses um she has power I'm trying to be not as like specific <laughs> right I've got blog posts talking about these books and I'll link those down below as well but there are they're spoilery so just beware but things are happening there's a dark one he's like the villain and shit's shit's going down he's breaking out of his prison there's like Trollocs who are like uh, think of them as orcs okay they're orcs basically but more disgusting that uh have been like killing peeps and just like showing up all over town and people don't realize that Trollocs are actually real but they're real when they're you know eating you <laughs> and they think that something's happening um Moraine has been tasked to find the dragon reborn which is the man who is going to destroy the world but also kill the dark one so like it's a win-win right so she's um she essentially finds Rand <laughs> sorry Rand Perrin and Matt and the way that the pattern which is essentially just like the way that uh the universe I'm not describing this properly but the way that the universe is molding itself around these three and how these three unknowingly are really heavily impacting what happens around them Moraine's like aha Tarverin did I say that right which basically is like people who are affecting the way that the wheel spins and the way that the pattern is weaved um and so she sees that and she's like one of you is the dragon reborn so she tells them like you need to leave your town because like the Trollocs that just destroyed it they're gonna keep on coming because they're essentially attracted to your energy right so we need to leave bitch and so Rand's like oh my god, oh my god. he's doing the whole martyr shit Perrin is a sweet precious boy he's very introspective very melancholy and I fucking love him Matt is a cunt in the beginning <laughs> he's kind of a dick right but they go, Egwen goes with them because she's like, fuck that, I want to come with you, hello. And she also has possibly Aes Sedai power. Nynaeve is like, you can't take my precious children, so I'm going to follow you. And that's what she does. And so we get this group of people who are trying to do the right thing and trying to conquer the Dark One and the things that happen as a result of the Dark One's shenanigans. But the Dragon Reborn, it's a pretty hefty burden. And when you're reading this series, especially the first like two or three, even the fourth one actually, I love the way Robert I love the way Robert Jordan kind of continues to emphasize that they're still technically they're kids you know they're like 19 maybe or like 17 18 19 they're, they're teen like they're still kind of children right uh even if they're over the age of majority they're they're just trying to grow up and you get really frustrated with some of the decisions that they make but then you realize like wait they're scared like they're absolutely terrified and especially with I'm, I'm gonna say Rand's character um which I won't say why but he's going through it because the potential of something happening is almost as destructive as like him actually doing it doing what he seemingly is supposed to maybe do and it's it's so fascinating the way that Robert Jordan writes foreshadowing is impeccable the way that he writes action scenes impeccable the way that he makes you terrified when all they're doing is like 
walking down a fucking road and you're like, oh my god, they're gonna die, they're gonna die. Like, it's just, he is, he was so incredible. Like, <sighs> I fucking love this series and I love the way that Robert John writes. A lot of people's complaint when they read the first book, which is The Eye of the World, is that it it's essentially right it reads like um lord of the rings fan fiction but that was the entire fucking point <laughs> like that was there was, there's a reason for that because it was that was what was selling at the time so robert jordan kind of makes this story that is very similar to what people love but if you read more <laughs> of the series you realize that robert jordan is just like you know what i'm gonna write my own bloody story and he fucking does like but I just, for me, I Have the World was one of those books that I wish I could reread for the first time. I wish I could read for the first time again because how I felt reading that book, I will never feel again. <laughs> I just love this series. And book four was a really interesting installment. You're, you're still getting so much world building. You're learning new things about the world, about the people in this world. I mean, the depth, the depth. That Robert Jordan gives to his cast of characters but also to the different cultures and the different like peoples is just you guessed it incredible I and yeah I just this was great Perrin was a standout character for me in this I just I, I have no other words to say I don't have book five yet but I, I am going to get book five soon. Cause I need, I, I just love this series. It's one of my favorite series that I'm currently reading and I'm very happy. Okay, next book. <laughs> or else I can be here all day talking about this series. The next book that I read was for a reading vlog that I cannot wait to redo. It's when I choose books out of a TBR jar. The TBR jar is literally right there. This one. I loved doing that vlog. It was one of the most like fun reading vlogs that I've ever done. And the first book that I chose out of the TBR jar was this book, The Inseparables by Simone de Beauvoir. I'm sorry. Who was going to tell me that this was amazing? <laughs> like, if you are into Sad Girl Lit, if you're into the runes, if you're into like Emily Austin or like Ali Smith, maybe. A little bit of Ali Smith with a hint of uh, Claire Keegan, just a, like a little sprinkle of Claire Keegan, right? That type of vibe. It's sad, but it's also an intense character study of the way religion um, impacts this young woman's life. And it's about, you know, friendship between two young women, but also it's mostly about being a woman and trying to understand your womanhood and your position just as a person existing in society with tradition and and religious identity even if the religious identity is mostly your family's religious identity but how that in turn can um i'm not gonna say control but kind of like it really controls this young woman um what's her name not sylvie Andre. So it's about Andre from the perspective of Sylvie. And you really see the way that Andre grapples with like this feeling of like suffocation and claustrophobia because the traditions and the religiousness, the religiosity, I should say, of her family so fundamentally like warps her as she grows up because it's, it's just so fascinating it is so fascinating and I think when I read this I talked about specifically like it's a growing like a coming of age but in in more like a, a cognitive type of thing where you see how Sylvie specifically grows up and her thought process her perception of her reality develops and changes and that is specifically in a direct response to like religion like it really is about religion and womanhood and like just being a woman. It's so fascinating to me and I cried because I think I'm pretty sure I read out the last, like one of the last sentences of this book. It's the last thing that Andre says to her mother 
and I broke down. I broke down because you see, you see the way that her family just ruins her. Like the way that her family's religious tradition and identity really, really just kills her. It's horrible and, and so beautiful and I love this book so much. Like I gave it four and a half stars when I first read it, but the more I talk about it, the more I think this is a five star read for me because I see myself rereading this and I see myself talking about this. Like it's just such a small novel, but so profound for me. One of those books that I think I read at the first, like the most perfect time, you know? Yeah. The Inseparables by Simone de Beauvoir. And then I read <laughs> In that same blog, kind of a random book that I was not expecting to pick out of a TBR jar, but when do you ever expect to pick a specific book out of a TBR jar? Children of Dune by Frank Herbert. Now this is book three in the Dune series, the Chronicles of Dune. I don't know what the bloody series is called. I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> uh, on one hand, I want to say that I really love being in this world. I love that this was very political and we see a lot more of the behind the scenes, like political machinations that are, that are happening and the way that these characters are trying to achieve certain things through specific ways. I thought that was really interesting, but, <laughs> but I, don't know how I feel about some of the choices that Frank Herbert made and I kind of wish he was standing next to me so I could be like what the fuck dude you know I just want to know why so I think I ended I not ended but I think I said three and a half stars let me just double check that because the world is interesting yeah i gave it three and a half stars the world is interesting but what is going on because i don't know and like do i want to continue this series i don't know yes and no because i'm terrified that's gonna go even more weird so that's a dilemma that i need to reflect on but yeah i if you don't know what this is about <laughs> this is we are on the planet of arrakis and it is the planet where the fremen live and it's very hot but it's also where a very important spice is made called, is it melange? Melange. This spice is literally imperative for the continuation of the entire universe, right? And so you have this family, the Atreides, the Atre Atreides, who come to like colonize and slash uh, rule over the planet of Arrakis and its peoples. Shit happens and the emperor, so to speak, his son takes over uh, and his son, through various plot things, becomes incredibly psychic and he can see the threads of all the possibilities of the way that the future is going. And so he embarks on certain decisions that result in not the greatest of situations and so it's really the first two books is him like grappling with the fact that he kind of fucked everything up because now we have people colonizing other peoples in the name of religion and there's just a violence and death um so it's like a commentary on colonization and religious colonization, but also just on the way that we treat our planet. So like, very interesting. Dune is my one of my favorite books of all time. Um, this book is the aftermath of what happens in book two, which is usually how, you know, series goes. It's the book, what, book two, book, you know what I mean? 
but specifically it's because Paul disappears who is the main character of Dune and, and the Emperor of Dune and so his sister Aaliyah becomes regent because his two children are children they're nine years old but not at the same time and it's very strange and so they're getting ready to like take over everything and then I just I just don't like the way that certain characters plot went their arc their character arcs I don't understand the whole Leto morphing into a sandworm I have no fucking idea what's going on and and now the two siblings are going to marry each other Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. And then the last book for that specific reading blog for the TV Jar, what I can't find my copy. I don't know where I put it. It's somewhere in here. I read The Sea, The Sea by Iris Murdoch. Now, again, I don't know what to say about this book because the first half of The Sea, The Sea by Iris Murdoch was absolutely gorgeous. I honestly thought I had a five star read. I honestly thought. I had a five star fucking read. I loved it. It was this intense character study. It was written as though the main character Charles was writing his diary. So you were reading his diary entries. And it was wonderfully philosophical, wonderfully introspective and reflective. And it was just so beautiful. The sea became such a huge like, element of the book. And it was its own character. And it was just fucking awesome. And then it changes and I don't know if it's because Charles himself is maybe undergoing like an, an actual deterioration of the mind and you know the book then showcases that but it focuses on this random woman that he was his first love and she's in the same town as him and he basically like kidnaps her and it just focuses on her and I hated it because it was so boring. It was so boring. I'm just like, I don't care about this woman. I don't care about your relationship with this woman. I don't care. I would have rather 500 pages of him just staring into the sea and like thinking about shit. I w that's what I would have rather happened. Instead of this random like drama thing. And I, I keep on saying this, but I'm like, maybe that was the point, but at one point you just have to say you know what it wasn't my cup of tea I don't care if that was the objective of the author I wanted the first half of the book to be the entire book but instead it was only the first half of the book would I read an Iris Murdoch book again potentially because some of her blurbs for some of the books are so like they remind me of Daphne du Maurier they're just like so wild and I just want to know what actually happens but at the same time I'm terrified <laughs> but that was that was the C to C I gave that three stars um from a five star to a three star like and then um I read what is the first I read two graphic novels in the month of August and this is the first one I read um Amelia Airwood basic witch by Emily Hampshire Kristen and James and Elliot. I can't see them. I'm guessing they're the right they are the writers and ghost writers. But Emily Hampshire is from uh Schitt's Creek. This one was also a slight disappointment. Like, on the surface of it, the premise sounds amazing. So it's about this young woman named Amelia. She's a witch, her family is a family of witches, and they're basically the Kardashians of the witch world, right? They're making bank their social media stars the mother is like invented spells that are just like so revolutionary and amazing and they have been filming a reality show but what Amelia doesn't know is that she's been cut off like cut out of the reality show they've essentially like pushed her out of the of the reality show because she's a failure of a witch and that's the running theme of the entire uh, graphic novel and then at the end this it's supposedly 
you know, supposed to be a satisfying conclusion, but it's not because Amelia deserved so much better. It ends with the mother being like, oh, I love you, Amelia, like, and then that's it. There's no apologies. There's no like, hey, mom, you wrote me out of the reality show. Like, you've called me a failure. Everyone knows that I'm now like the worst daughter to ever be fucking daughter. And that's it. It was just, it felt really rushed. It felt as though this was book one, you know, of a series. But I don't think it is. I think it's just a standalone. But it needed, it needed to be part of a series because there needed to be more of a, just more of the mum and Amelia, like, actually talking. And the mum actually being like, I'm so fucking sorry of how, like, dog shit I've been to you. Because she treated Amelia horribly. And just, like, the entire family kind of went along with it. So that was a bit of a disappointment. Ooh! And then I read Turtles All The Way Down by John Green. This was for the book club that I have with Em and Tiff. I've never read a John Green novel before. This is my first one. Yep. I really liked it. I gave it four stars. I thought it was beautiful. Um, do, you ever read, do you ever read a book that makes you wish that you read it when you were a teenager? So that was this book. I feel like if I read it when I was in high school, I was undiagnosed with anxiety. I was not medicated. I was a shell of the person that I am now. Uh, I would have so deeply connected with this book and it would have felt so kind of like relieving to have a name for the things that I was feeling specifically about, specifically like the anxiety and the depression that I was going through, but not having the words and being able to like identify what I was feeling as that. I just thought it was normal and oh like I'm having a panic attack, panic attack it's just asthma like not realizing that it was actually a panic attack like yeah that was a thing like I thought my panic attacks were just my asthma it wasn't until I actually talked about it with like my mum and stuff that she's like no bitch like you're ha well she didn't call me bitch but she's like no that's you're having panic attacks oh my god Alex what the fuck <laughs> I was having panic attacks like on the train on the buses in shopping centers like I wasn't very social because social it's like just being social like social situations triggered my anxiety to the nth degree and I still struggle with it like it's not something that goes away when you're medicated <laughs> it's still something that I, I definitely struggle with and it makes me feel like absolute shit and the way and turtles all the way all the way down is about Azza or Azza who has OCD and anxiety and it's just her experience of living. And there's also like a little bit of a, of a mystery, but it's mostly about Azure herself and her feelings and the way that she experiences reality and how different it is to her best, her so-called best friend, which we're gonna talk about in a second because what the fuck? What the fuck? Like the way that her best, I forgot her best friend's name, but the way that her best friend treats her and the fan fiction she writes based on Aja was just absolutely horrible. And I kind of wanted more of a, like, just more groveling. But overall, it was just a really, really fantastic, fantastically written novel that I think will continue to bring a lot of people comfort, especially young people, as the years go by. Like, similar to when I read... Perks of being a wa uh, wallflower. Perks of being a wallflower. When I read that for the first time, it was like, I wish I read this in high school. I wish I read this in high school. I wish. Because I would have felt seen and I would have felt like, oh my God, is this what I'm feeling? <laughs> like the way that I am is not typical. Like it's just, there's a reason for it. Like it, it was just, it was just really, really kind of wonderful to to read and I cried and I read this on the plane <laughs> going to Cairns 
And then I read Seven Little Australians by Ethel Turner. Now I read this as like a buddy read slash read along with my friend Evie from the the little attic library. The, oh my god, what was Evie? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will put her channel. I'll link it down below. I'm so sorry. The the little attic library. Anyway, she's absolutely wonderful. Go check her out. I was going to do a reading vlog for this book, but I read it so quickly in cans that I absolutely forgot. So if I can find the footage, whatever I filmed, I will, it would be a very quick reading vlog. But I read, it's an Australian classic and well, it's set in Australia, it's an Australian classic. And it's about these seven, seven children. It's about a family. I thought it was good. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't like something that I loved reading. I didn't like, I think I was reading too much into it, but we have a, a one of the uh, oldest children. She, I forgot her name. She's like, I think the oldest daughter or like the second oldest daughter. And she, highly intelligent, you know, she would do things that, you know, a normal girl is not supposed to do like you know very very uh, much bucking the the etiquette of you know young ladies and because of that she gets sent to like a boarding school where I'm guessing the individuality and passion was beaten out of her but she I'm just gonna say it spoiler she dies at the end and it just felt like a moral thing for me to me and I I um and Evie didn't she didn't I don't think she like read into this so I think it was more me um just over analyzing and and maybe seeing things that aren't actually there but I was like well so you're telling young women to not act the way that this young woman was acting because she'll be sent away and maybe die like it was it felt very like don't do this and I didn't really like that uh I didn't at all and like trigger warnings for also like child abuse or like discipline you know it was written in the 1800s also the dad was a dick the dad was a dick but it was interesting the way that the story was written specifically of like the relationship between the father and the children and his new wife and the children so that was kept me going but not only favorite and I don't know if I would read Ethel Turner again to be quite frank with you but when Evie and I decide on a new book for the read-along I'll let well I think we'll both let you know just in case you want to read alongside with us we're trying to focus on Australian authors and like First Nations Australians so the next book that I, I read The Dutch House by Anne Patchett now I've never read Anne Patchett before and I'm so fucking excited that I did I read this immediately after Seven Little Australians and honestly they're so similar <laughs> like in a really weird way they give off a very similar vibe specifically regarding just like the family dynamics The Dutch House if you don't know is about a family who um, moves into the Dutch house. It's a this mansion, this beautiful mansion that was originally owned by a family who were called the Van Hobecks, the Van Hobeeks. They made their money in cigarettes um, either during or after the war, I or maybe both, I forgot. What happens is this family, who I forgot the name of this family, who moves in. We're in the perspective of the youngest boy, Danny, and Danny is essentially talking about growing up in the Dutch house with his sister Maeve and how his mum just like left. She just like left them with their dad and their dad was not a very emotive man uh, and it's about like childhood and family and love but also just f not forgiveness but kind of um it really does center Danny and Maeve his sister I loved 
them two. I thought their relationship was just so beautiful and I think it felt very authentic to like a sibling relationship. <laughs> Maybe not to many, but it that type of like sometimes you piss me off but I will literally die for you kind of thing. It was really interesting. Um, I still don't quite like, I don't know how I feel about the mother and the way that that storyline resolved because the mother's, what's that, that word, like excuse or reason for leaving the children was because of the house. And so the house was very much a character and for the mother it was this huge burden and responsibility that she did not want and her like identity was very much tied to like we are poor and we are poor because God has a higher purpose for us kind of and then when her husband just like out of the blue purchases mansion with money that she had no idea that he had moving into a house with the furniture of the old the previous owners like they slept on the same bed as as this family right they 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 would at the dining table of the van hobeeks like none of the furniture was moved and there's this like gigantic painting of the of the family like it was just it didn't really feel like her house and it, it was like she was playing house and so she left and i just thought i wish we could have gotten a bit more deeper into her choices and maybe just like a conversation about like the responsibility and uh the like emotional and mental labor of being a mother and like being a wife and not being heard maybe i don't know i just that was like a it was weird that was weird i think it was weird but the story overall absolutely loved it i loved it i can't wait to read more and patch it love the way it was written at times it did feel clunky um that, like in, in sentences and my copy had heaps of spelling errors but it was just so well written it was just so emotional and wonderful it was wonderful and i can't wait to read more and patch it if you have any recommendations please let me know i do know she's come out with a like a recent release called tom lake that i have my eye on uh but i think i want to read maybe like commonwealth or something before i pick up her most recent novel but like watch me pick up tom lake watch me watch me do it anyway the last book that i read in the month of august was also again an, a disappointment and i'm reading this for an upcoming video that you will see so i'm not going to talk very much about it but a lesson in vengeance by victoria lee this is i feel like this was promoted back in 2021 when it was released as like a sapphic sacred history and yeah like i definitely see like where that comes from it's dark academia it is sapphic it is kind of witchy and creepy um we have you know a cast of characters who are not uh, well they're not superheroes basically like they they are fine with you know murder and stuff like it's it's very much giving secret history in terms of the characters right and the character dynamics however I found this really boring. I'll be honest with you. I found it quite boring. I, the main character, I didn't even remember her name, Felicity. Felicity as a character was so exceptionally boring to read. Um, and that's really where this book kind of failed for me. Like I didn't care about connecting to the characters because it's not something that I necessarily care about. It's about just as a character she was boring to read and you're only in her perspective and I just couldn't do I couldn't really care about what was happening like the things that happened where it's supposed to shock you did not shock me because I did not feel at all engaged with this because I was just so fucking bored the fact that I didn't DNF it I should win an award honestly I should win an award like for me, The Secret History, one of my favorite books of all time, if not maybe my number one book of all time, Richard is a horrible person. The cast of characters in The Secret History are all horrible people, right? 
but fuck, you can't stop reading. That didn't have that. Like, this didn't have that at all. And I feel like maybe also it is young adult. So maybe for me, I was just not vibing with the way it was written. Um, but I just, I, yeah, I couldn't care less. I think I ended up giving this three stars, but that's because there were parts of this, like, you know, descriptions of things. I was like, oh, that's good. But everything else, I was like, oh, okay, sure. Like, I don't know. I Maybe just, like, go more darker. I think if this was written for, an, for adults... It would have been so much better, but I just don't think that it was for me. I don't know if the way that the author writes her stories and her characters for me either. So that's a bit of a bit of a sad thing. But yeah, that was uh, my August. It's be my August again. Some really good books and some not so great books. And I can't wait to see what September holds. Thank you so much for watching. I hope. You had fun watching me talk talk for a very long time about the books that I read in August. And I will see you next week. Please let me know your favourite book of the month of August and your least favourite book of the month of August. Because I would like to know. Because I'm nosy like that. And I will see you next week. Happy reading, friends. Bye.